Fluorescence microscopy is great, but two of the evil side effects that one often has to manage with fluorescence microscopy are photobleaching and phototoxicity. And these are illustrated in this movie here where you're watching rhodamine labeled microtubules moving along a kinesin coated surface. And over time of illumination, you can see that the fluorescence signal begins to get dimmer. That's photobleaching. And these microtubules have also become fragmented into many uh, small pieces. And this is phototoxicity because the illumination is actually uh, destroying and breaking up these microtubules. So uh, if one's trying to capture living biology, one needs to collect the images, but one's trying not also to destroy the sample that one's trying to observe. So in this little tip video, I'll discuss ways in which one could minimize these unwanted side effects of fluorescence microscopy. So photobleaching, what is that? Well, this has been discussed in other lectures in the course. It's the loss, irreversible loss of fluorescence due to the excitation of the fluorophore. Um, and you can see this illustrated very nicely uh, in this field of uh, single GFP molecules. Each of these spots is a single GFP. And over time, you can see that individual spots suddenly disappear um, and the fluorescence is lost. So uh, this disappearance of the fl fluorescence from these individual GFP molecules is uh, photobleaching. Um, and this photobleaching is, occurs more rapidly at higher light exposures. And it's also very dependent upon uh, the fluorophore that one's using. Some fluorophores bleach faster than others. And even the environment of the fluorophore. It may depend even how the fluorophore is bound specifically uh, to your protein molecule. Uh, the other effect is phototoxicity. So this is actually damage uh, to your specimen. Um, it could be uh, damage to your cells or molecules that you're trying to observe in vitro, like you saw with kinesin and microtubules. Um, there are two types of phototoxicity. One is due to direct absorption of light um, without the fluorescence. And um, UV light, in particular the higher energy wavelengths of light, tend to be particularly damaging. So uh, in, in many cases, if one uh, can use longer wavelength light, like green light or red light, that tends to be less, uh, less absorbed and less damaging uh, to cells. The other type of phototoxicity uh, is indirect and occurs through the actual excitation of the fluorophore, uh, which uh, can give rise to the production of reactive oxygen species. And these are uh, a series of uh, highly uh, uh, reactive uh, radicals that can either interact with the fluorophore or also just interact with any nearby macromolecules uh, and damage them. Uh, and this is obviously something that one wants to avoid if one wants to keep one's specimen uh, happy and healthy during the course of observation. So there are some things that you can do to uh, mitigate both photobleaching and phototoxicity. Um, if one's lucky enough to be doing microscopy in an in vitro sample, uh, in those cases you can actually re remove molecular oxygen uh, from the buffer. And uh, there are things called oxygen uh, scavenger systems, which are in fact uh, an enzymatic mixture that will um, remove uh, the uh, oxygen from the solution. And there are also um, things that one can add that uh, react with these reactive oxygen species and scavenge them before they can do uh, damage uh, to the cell or uh, macromolecule. In a fixed specimen, there are also uh, ways of mounting your specimen, your immunofluorescent specimen, um, and um, commercial agents called antifade that minimizes the rate of, uh, of photobleaching to allow longer observation. Now, I'll just show you an example of depleting molecular oxygen. Uh, this is a, that specimen I showed you that's being all fragmented here uh, due to the reactive oxygen species. And here is the exact same uh, type of specimen here with these oxygen scavengers now added uh, to the buffer system. And you can see that uh, photo uh, bleaching is minimized. and the kinesin molecules are very happily moving the microtubules, and the microtubules are, aren't being fragmented. Um, so this just shows how powerful 
uh, removing molecular oxygen can be. So if we're, we're working with living cells or tissues, we can't obviously remove molecular oxygen. So we have to think of other strategies for minimizing um, photobleaching and toxicity. And the basic strategy is to minimize the light exposure on your specimen. Um, and naturally, there's a, a trade-off here. The more photons that we illuminate the specimen with, the more fluorescence will be produced and we get a better signal to noise. But um, if we over-illuminate, uh, we also risk the, the danger of also creating more photo damage and uh, in, in, in that way actually interfering with the processes in the cell that we're actually trying to observe. So um, there's several things that we could do. First of all, uh, shutter the light source. Uh, during times when one's not actually collecting the image, uh, the light so source should be uh, turned off. Um, and there are many ways now there, uh, to shut the light source and control it with a computer. Secondly, is just to minimize the light exposure. Again, we want to uh, collect a decent signal to noise, but um, particularly for very uh, light sensitive processes in cells, we want to minimize uh, the light exposure. And that can be done in a few ways. One is uh, uh, through the illumination intensity itself and also uh, the exposure time that we are uh, collecting photons on the camera. So between the intensity and exposure time, uh, that gives you your signal. Um, and one has to really think about both of these parameters very carefully. Someone's getting uh, a good image, but again, not over illuminating and potentially causing photo damage. And um, the other thing we can control in a time lapse movie is the interval between exposures. Uh, and that depends on the dynamics of your process. But if you're working, trying to observe a very slow process that's going on in a cell, we have the luxury then of shuttering uh, the light source for a longer period of time in between exposures. And that also minimizes photo damage. Um, another big breakthrough is really using very sensitive uh, cameras. Uh, and elsewhere in the course, you can learn about these new cameras called EMCCD cameras. And these have been a really big breakthrough in live cell imaging uh, because they're extremely sensitive. Uh, and that allows one to use uh, very low um, illumination of the specimen and still collect uh, very good images and create less photo damage. Uh, and the other uh, potential strategy uh, is also to minimize um, out-of-focus light exposure. If one's trying to collect a particular plane of illumination and image that plane, but one's bathing the specimen above and below that plane with light, you're potentially just creating uh, photo damage in the cell, um, but not, and that, that out-of-focus light is not contributing to the image. So there are a couple of very powerful techniques, uh, total internal uh, reflection uh, uh, fluorescence microscopy uh, and light sheet microscopy are both very good ways uh, to minimize uh, out-of-focus light exposure. So um, these are a few tips, and uh, I hope you can uh, employ them. Uh, and remember, you want to create great images, but also keep your molecules and cells happy. Thank you.